All right, welcome to another episode of Let to Be Talk. Uh, fantastic guest today. Introduce yourself, my friend. Uh, my name is Alexis Sprake, and I'm the director of The World According to Ali Willis. What a fantastic film. Oh, thank you so much. I mean, you know, I got to tell you, I am a giant music head, and I love Earth, Wind & Fire. I grew up in the 70s. I'm 58, Earth, Wind & Fire, the Commodores, all of that. And at no time did I even know that Allie wrote some of these songs, the huge ones like September and Boogie Wonderland. It's mind boggling. Yeah, I mean, I think it's funny. I had the same experience coming into the film because I knew a little bit about Allie Willis when I started the project. But as I started to get to know her body of work, I realized that she'd been a part of my life the entire time because she's written so many touchstone, like cultural touchstones and, and major songs. And I think, you know, part of her um, anonymity when it comes to Earth, Wind & Fire is that in those days, it wasn't a great thing to be a female songwriter. So even on the albums, her, she's credited as A. Willis to try to maintain some gender neutrality, you know, so people, you know, in fact, years later when um, she wrote, what have I done to deserve this with the Pet Shop Boys, she actually met them because she was doing, she'd moved into doing fine art and their manager hired her to do a portrait of them. And they, she went out to the UK to do a portrait of them and they started chatting about what they did. And they were like, wait, you're not the A. Willis on those albums. You know, they were blown away. And then they decided to, you know, make it exciting. The Pet Shop Boys don't work with a lot of third parties. And that was uh, a unique situation where they decided to work with another artist and made a really, you know, again, another song that's just really endured the test of time. Yeah, it's um, it's amazing, too. Not only is she a woman, but she's a white woman in that uh, era of R&B and a man's world, you know, so just to have that incredible sense of groove and even that one spot where they're doing that. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and she's like, yeah, that's not going to work. And he's like, yeah, this is going to work. You know, it's, it's amazing to see that chemistry on this. And I mean, I, I can't even tell you how much I love that era of music and you really never know who wrote the songs. If you think about it, you know, like earth, wind and fire, most people wouldn't even know who the members are. They had like seven members, you know, and mega hits, you know? Well, Earth, Wind & Fire, I guess, is more of an institution in a way, you know, they're right. like, the, but, you know, Allie, you know, she was Jewish. She grew up in Detroit when Motown and it was emerging in Detroit. Stax was happening, Chess, you know, all of these black labels and uh, black artists were finally crossing over, although Allie was like a, a very unique 11 and 12 year old girl who was discovering this stuff before it crossed over when radio stations were segregated. And she, um, you know, would joke that they would put the black station so far down the dial that it would almost fall off if you twisted, you know, down the radio uh, to hear them. But that was a huge influence for her. And then I think, you know, on the flip side, um, it took, you know, all of her big breaks and you really see this in the film with, um, whether it was Patti LaBelle or, uh, Bonnie Raitt or M Verdine and Maurice White, like it took women and people of color to see her past her identity and just see her for her talent and give her her big breaks and give her those opportunities. That was really a consistent theme in her career is that's where she was breaking through. So I think it was just all about the music, which was, which is, you know, such a special and unique thing, especially with the conversation we're having today about, you know, um, still about race. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, growing up in Detroit, a woman, uh, a lesbian woman, you find out, uh, obviously, in the film, uh, parents don't want her near Hitsville, Motown. She's down there. I was there a few years ago. It was my first time. You're standing on that lawn in front of that small little house, and you're just like, it, it's going on in there. That's where it was happening. She could hear these people recording in that back room. I've been in there. It's like the size of a shoebox. And they're in there making the greatest songs of all time. And then she later gets into the business and is writing some of the biggest hits ever. I just love this story. And the crazy part about it is she was filming herself since 78. So she had all this footage. So you really... You really got the story there. Yeah, I mean, that was, uh, that was, I mean, some 
that was that sort of ideal dream with, with a documentary because there's always great stories out there, but they're hard to bring or resurrect or bring to life because you don't have the material. And if Ali bought a piano in 1969, we had the classified ad. Like we had every little detail, you know, that that you could imagine. And, you know, I think that um, and she was just so it was funny. She was on this journey. You know, I think, like you said, when you sit on the lawn of Motown and that's what Ali did. And she has a line in the film where she says music was my babysitter because when her mom passed away, an untimely death, and she sort of had the evil stepmom and a very chaotic home life, she started to take, you know, a refuge essentially there. And, you know, she never went in. She went in. She met Barry Gordy much later in her life after all of her success. I think she was in her 60s and finally went in. And Motown did an ex exhibit on her at the museum, which I think was obviously like a pinnacle of her career. But that a whole influence played out in this. This She was just a fan sitting outside because they would discover people sitting on the lawn to bring in. I mean, that was how they discovered a lot of their top artists at, at Motown. Um, and for Ali, it was a, a little bit of a different relationship, but it was really great putting the film together with all of that material because as we were trying to, you know, piece together, you know, I always say making a documentary is like drawing a map to a place that you've never been. And you're going through all this archive. She really left us everything we could possibly need, you know, to do justice to the story. You know, it's funny, I, I, I'm i not in any way some kind of egomaniac, but I've lived this insane life. And as I watched her film, I'm like, this is the people that I gravitate towards. You know, I'm not going to work nine to five. There's something that constantly keeps me driving, you know, forward, moving forward, no matter what doors close, you keep going. I'm 58, a white guy trying to make it in comedy. That's like, no way, you know? And as I watched her story, I was like, this is just incredible. Because like you said, awful upbringing, the evil stepmom. Uh, she wants to play music, you know. Most people might not even think, you know, she's unusually tall, radical look. You know, her look was uh, what I loved about her. Like when you saw her, you go, oh, I know who that is. You know, as I watched the film, I go, oh, I know this lady. I just didn't know her history. Because you'd see her throughout the, you know, the world of music from the 80s and 90s when I was playing music, you know? Yeah, no, she she like did definitely did not want to be invisible. She had this asymmetrical haircut and her clothing was like this cacophony of like colors and patterns. But it really, she always managed to pull it together. A lot of vintage and a lot of custom pieces. And she just never, I mean, I think Paul Feig says it. Um, but she never wasted an opportunity to tell you who she was. And that was down to what she was wearing. Every piece of every item in her object in her house, what kind her of car. car. She drove. Yeah, everything. And um, and I think that, you know, like she wanted you to have that reaction. I'm so like glad with you seeing the film that you felt that way. She wanted to activate people's creativity and make them feel good about staying on the path where they were expressing their own individuality uh, and being themselves, because that was something that was really hard for her. She didn't. She didn't have the acceptance from her family for her sexuality. She was very criticized for just not fitting, you know, 1950s gender norms. And, you know, down her whole life, I think that was like a real demon that she was battling. And so it took a lot of perseverance for her to put on that outward persona. And but the whole point of those outfits was yes, to tell you who she was, but also to give you a little permission, give you permission to be a little extra. And I think that's like been the most satisfying thing in sharing the film is that people watching it seem to come out of it and feel like invigorated or like they've been sort of given permission or a green light to do that thing that maybe they've felt a little bit uh, apprehensive or held back, inhibited in their own life. And um, and that's really why I believe so much in the film and the story. Yeah, you know, throughout my life, I always hear people go like, oh, man. I could never wear something like that. I mean, that's you. And it's like, hey, you just go fucking do it. There's no rules. I grew up in the Bay Area in the 80s when the gap started hitting and people were wearing cotton dockers. And I was like, get me the fuck out of here. What is this outfit? You know, this this uniform of normalcy. So uh, I really related with her down to everything. I am an architecture 
mid-century freak. Her house lit me on fire. I was like, oh my God, I love this house. The insanity of all the trinkets and the bowling balls into the concrete and her car and, and the painting the house pink. You know, the neighbors were like, what the fuck, <laughs> you know? But I, I mean, it, I couldn't have related with someone more uh, in a film in years than, than Ali. It was unbelievable to me watching this. Uh, that makes me so happy. Her house is just, I mean, I joke, it's like the original Pee Wee's Playhouse. And of course she was good friends with Paul Rubens. And I think there was a lot of like in cross pollination of influences there, but she really, you know, if you see it, it's like, it's a streamlined modern house designed by this uh, architect, William Kessling, who only has a few uh, houses in Southern California, but they're very iconic. And she just leaned into the curve where you expect things to be squared off. And she put in, you know, color and 1950s, like atomic furniture, which also has those curves. And she said this great thing, actually, I, it's not in the film, but it was something that I read in her journals, uh, which was, you know, she started writing music when she was in New York because she worked at a record label as like a copy editor, you know, doing what then were called special projects, which were any albums by people of color or women, special projects, right? Everything segregated. And that was when she started writing music. And this was like the time when women as songwriters were really kind of more like the long haired, like, you know, Carol King and uh, Laura Nero and, and, and in that kind of vein. And she said when she came out to L.A., just like the sunlight and the colors, she's like her whole rhythm changed. And that's when you got September. That's when you got her like really soulful, groovy, grooving hits. And um, I think that's part of why she immersed herself in that environment, because it just really like stimulated her the creativity in her brain. And when you're in there, you do think a little bit differently. It's definitely uh, her house is an explosion of 80s not just the look of it, but of course, people like uh, Mark from Debo hanging out, Paul Rubens, uh, the, uh, Cindy Lauper, all these people were gravitated and they were all amazing outside the box artists. So just to be at one of those parties, she would have these epic parties to be at one of those must have been amazing. It did look like the cocaine was hidden, right? <laughs> I mean, I no comment, but I definitely... Um, Everybody was taking advantage of every opportunity to let yeah. to be uninhibited. Dennis Leary was there, if that tells you anything. Yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, the no, her parties were incredible because she would create these amazing. She just and she gravitated. I mean, she loved she loved the people, the kind of people that you just named, and these really big stars. But she also loved, you know, she loved B movie actors, you know, or or just people like Bud Cord or like you know, everyone she brought together had some kind of way that she was like a huge fan of them. And so it was like for her, this opportunity, I think, to bring together a lot of her different um, skills as an artist. It was uh, music. She would do like this decor, like this, all these art projects. There'd often be like in immersive interactive activities at the party she would make the food would always be some sort of presentation of just like some insane part of her brain like it was not necessarily edible but there was always this incredible spread and um and she would she would create like this entire experience and everyone we talked to who did get to go to those parties it was like they would just talk about how you, even if you were someone who was more like, oh, just likes to sort of sit back and observe at a party or whatever, she would get you involved. You know, I think Michael Patrick King says, you know, like, like sometimes you just need to sit off on the sideline and then be like, okay, I'm ready. Like put me back in coach, you know, I can, uh, but she really made sure everyone was participating. And I think that was part of why she ended up being this very early adapter and um, innovator in the internet space, because she understood interactivity and social connection in a way in her life that I, when she saw the internet, she's like, Oh, this is like a more efficient way to do this. Um, and that was like in the nineties when most of us weren't even attempting email, you know, much less uh, thinking of the internet as a place to, to uh, express ourselves creatively or make friends. Yeah. I mean, got back then, you know, as I'm watching her, so I want to tell everybody, make sure you see this documentary because you're actually watching somebody that is just a soldier in art. She's like this songwriter. And then she's like, wait a minute. 
the internet, this looks like except I'm talking ground floor of shitty dial up. That old that old fucking modem. And she goes full in art on the internet, which which is nuts because it was so ahead of its time. And that must have been so slow and grindy. And you just work for hours just to get one little blip on the internet. And not a lot of people were on it, like you said, you know. So it's just wild how she got completely infatuated with that and uh, and dove head down into that. Yeah, it was. I mean, Mark Cuban was her CEO in those early days. And again, this was like 1990, 1991. She was going up to Silicon Valley to these conferences and being told by people like no one will ever buy anything on the Internet. These are executives that like Intel. And so I think, you know, that is like a, a real signpost of a true artist. She was a real visionary. And it's really fun in the film to see she makes all of these. Dis- you would never think the same person was sort of this wrote the musical, the color purple and September and the friends theme song, or also came up with one of the first ideas for a social network or, you know, any of these things, but they all kind of make sense when you enter Ali's world. And I think that's another reason it's like really fun to watch the film. Cause it's just like, it's a trip. How do you get involved with making the film and what was the initial process? Cause you see her garage full of stuff. So was it in storage? Who calls you? Did you make documentaries before this? Because I don't ever really look people up because I like to just let it unfold naturally. But tell me your story and how you got involved. And of course, you had to watch all of this stuff. I mean, it's I've made a documentary before and it's absolutely, you know, brutal. You're just like, oh, how does it happen? I mean, in this case, I was really quite lucky because I had made I do make documentaries and I had been doing a documentary project that I interviewed uh, Paul Rubens, better known as Pee Wee Herman, and he and I became good friends. And then he introduced me to Ali Willis's life partner, Prudence, who appears in the film and is an executive producer on the film. Um, kind of under false pretenses, which is a very Paul thing to do. And we're talking about something else. And then Prudence is make, is kind of mentioning that she has this documentary she needs to do because Ali, one of her final wishes was that somebody put together, I think she says in her diaries, the trail she left behind. And that trail was like six storage units. Every There's like little structures in her backyard that look like these really cool pool houses or just do you think something cool is happening there? It's just more stuff. And um, this massive collection and, you know, like you mentioned, she's been filming her life since 1978. I mean, 10,000 hours of footage at least. Um, And we started talking and I, I just I'm a fourth generation Angelino and I love a lot of the music. Music was like that Ali had worked on was was things I was passionate about. So I just had a lot of different like points of entry and connection to her. So I pitched myself for it and luckily Prudence and I hit it off. And then when we started working on it, I think, you know, the, the big thing with a project when you have this much material, cause you do have to, I mean, I think to do, to do it justice, you do need to look at everything um, or as much as humanly possible. And um, I'm lucky I'm partnered with a uh, producer, Nick Coles, who's like extremely fastidious um, and indefatigable when it comes to archives. So when I would feel like I was like, I think we have enough. He was still making sure that we didn't leave any stone unturned. But the big question I had was why Ali left the documentary to be made by somebody else, because she was a multifaceted artist and she did a lot of worked in a lot of different mediums, including film. And I feel like she could have, she probably would have made a 20 hour documentary, but she could have made a film about herself. Um, and I think it really did come down to some of the things that we started the conversation talking about, which was that there was a lot of vulnerability and a darker aspect of her life. And I think the lack of ever feeling like accepted or loved for who she was by her by her parents and um, and not always being comfortable in her own skin or with her sexuality or in how she presented in terms of gender norms and whatnot. That was stuff she kind of left out when she was dealing with her friends in her life. She was this like beacon of positivity and self-expression and individuality and this cheerleader for everyone. And I think she understood that if she if the documentary told the other side of that coin, she would reach more people because it is hard to go out there and express yourself and to be yourself and be authentic. 
And her journey to self-acceptance was hard, but she made it look so easy in her lifetime. And in her diaries, some of the things she said was that, you know, she really wanted this film to be made, but she hoped she didn't lose her nerve and destroy everything, you know, before she died. And that was a big clue to me that she didn't want it to just be like a puff piece or some pat thing. Because what's to be afraid of if all you leave behind is kind of a sanitized version of yourself. And so even her life partner of 30 years, like I was calling her all the time and being like, you won't believe like this tape I just listened to and what Ali was dealing with or what she said. But um, so we all learned a lot. And uh, it's funny now that the film's coming out because a lot of people really close to her who sat for interviews in the film, I know are going to be, you know, I think I, I think they'll see that it's an authentic portrait of Ali, but I think they'll also realize there was a lot going on there that she just never let anyone in into that she wanted people to know about who are sharing similar struggles. I don't think I've met ever met an, a great artist. I want to put that in front. Great. That didn't have dark, dark, you know, side to them. And uh, I just don't think you could be, Perfect and a great artist, you know. What's really interesting about this film is I'm good friends with Linda Perry, and uh, she is a humongous songwriter, and she has a documentary coming out on herself that I just watched. And I was like, the I see so much of of uh, Ali in Linda. It's wild, man. It, I mean, as I watch this, the parallels, the lesbian woman that's, you know, banging on doors going, fuck you. I am someone I'm human. I'm a songwriter. I'm great. I'm a producer or whatever. It's amazing to watch these two documentaries back to back. Yeah, that's great. I really want to see that film. I'm a huge Linda Perry fan, so I've I've definitely read about it. Um, and I think I mean, I think those things stay with you. One of the things I did when I started this project um is started reading just biographies of artists, memoirs of artists and celebrities that I was interested in, just just to see if it would help frame how I approach this. And you think you're going to just be reading about them and what this some amazing back stories of what inspired this or that, and every single one without fail was about their relationship with their mother or their father or both or the relationship they didn't have. And I mean, I think we're all human at the end of the day and artists are really good at capturing those aspects of our life experiences and mirroring them back to us and making us feel seen. And to do that, you have to be able to stay you know, with that inner child and you have to be able to go to those kind of painful and honest places. And I think that's can be a very lonely and isolating way to live. And then you're being so vulnerable and you're also asking on the business side, people to invest in you or to, to endorse you in some way. And that involves a lot of rejection and again, a lot more vulnerability. So it's amazing that people even subject themselves to it, but thank God they do. Cause that's why we have all this, awesome music to listen to and art and um, and ho feel a little bit less lonely and a little more understood as we go through our lives. When you started it, how long did it take? A couple years? What was the uh, time frame? Yeah, I guess that's fair to say. I mean, it's always hard to pinpoint because like to the point like today with the film coming out, well, there's a lot of time where it's like once the film's done, you're submitting to festivals and then you're getting a distributor and then the distributor's timing it in the calendar and all of those different things. But I think from the point that we actually like picked up a camera to, you know, putting a pin in the edit, I would say was probably mm, about 18 months. And, wow. and that's with us juggling other projects as well, you know, um, because the best thing you can do with a documentary is be flexible. Like you're trying to interview a lot of celebrities. They're not, if they're off doing a movie, like it's better if you're, if you can shoot a little bit staggered and still catch that interview near the end so that you can get as many people. in. there's a lot of um, ways that I feel like, you know, you, you could, you could, I, I could also answer that question and say that it's been four years, but it's just, that's not really accurate because a lot of that time is sort of downtime where it's, it's either, waiting again for the marketplace or we were, I knew Prudence and I knew we were working together, but we were waiting on investors. You know, there's it was just, there's a lot of uh, moving parts, but I would say about 18 months of actual real, you know, being focused on it. I think the most interesting thing in the film is 
I played music for 25 years and now I am a comedian for 15 years. I've been in the biz for 40 years. The crazy thing to me about her story is, and I, I want to let people know, because when you're watching this, you're like, this lady should be a gazillionaire. So I don't really understand what kind of publishing deal she signed because I know people that wrote somebody recently wrote a, a TV theme song. Um, well, not recently, but years ago for um, South Park. And they are just set for life. Now, this woman wrote the theme for Friends, the biggest show, one of the biggest shows of all time. And she was struggling for money, man. It's wild to see. Do you understand what was going on? Was it a bad deal or was she, did she sign a, with a publishing company where it was just a salary? I mean, she had a lot of bad deals and, and, and it's funny because I did talk to some of her, I talked to her collaborators on the color purple who are a little bit, a bit, a bit younger than her. I mean, significantly younger than her, uh, like Stephen Bray. And he was saying when she was negotiating her deal for that, that he really had to step in because she was so accustomed to the type of deals that they were offering songwriters in the seventies that were very exploitative. And she was just used to that. So, you know, when people were moving a lot of records and CDs in the marketplace, even those bad deals could be quite lucrative, but obviously in the current climate, I mean, it's really, if you're not, not a performing songwriter and you're not a Linda Perry, you are not making any money right of course, now. Of course. That's, you know, they're making their money cheering. I think another big part of it was that, you know, this is a huge problem in the industry today. Ali was an incredible producer. She was, she was, you know, it, once I got to the point where we could go into her archives and hear the demos for Neutron Dance, and then you hear the release song or, you know, any of these songs, the producer is using her arrangement that when she shot, you know, she, you, as a songwriter, you make this demo, she got all of the equipment. She became very technically um, skilled uh, in, in producing and actually like sending in really very polished demos to get artists to want to pick up and record them. And then somebody else would come on and produce it and basically use her arrangement while well, the money and the stability for a songwriter that's not performing in music is in producing. And today, even now, I don't know the exact number, but it's under 3% of produced music is produced by, uh, pop music is produced by women. So at that time, it just was unheard of. And it, like, I think the I Am album for Earth, Wind & Fire says it all. She wrote more songs on that album. And the ones that you like, In the Stone, Boogie Wonderland, you know, like huge songs um, than David Foster. And David Foster left that album and became a huge producer. And he's got the house in Malibu and the whole thing. You know, I, you know, I think Ali, the other part of it as an artist is like, she was probably a little bad with money because when she had it, she wanted to spend it on a new art project. She wanted to do things without people telling her how to do them. So she was always just reinvesting in her ideas. And that was not always financially sound but you're right and and with the friends theme song I mean we deal with it in the film I mean to be fair like people didn't think that was a hit show to go out she came on and and did it to get out of her publishing deal she'd kind of moved on to her internet um uh, interests and projects but she um got paid nothing for it and then when it was a hit song a bunch of producers on the show came in and diluted her um percentage because that was they, brutal to watch I, that it was insane man i'm just like you just watch an evil right on the screen you know i mean it would the amount of money the difference it would have made to her versus what i don't know what it, people got paid to make those episodes but it's pretty legendary that it was like it was good money producing friends um yeah so i mean i think that was really but you know you see this all the time i mean i think it's a huge i'm i'm and i'm not really qualified to speak about it I, there's people who know a lot more but like the music it's kind of a me i mean i think i don't even know but there's people who i think participate in the rights of september who are like just managing one of the people in the band or something you know what i mean they didn't actually and i know like on the flip side of that although i mean she contributed so much to music so i don't begrudge her but like estelle axton one of the founders of stacks i think made it a fortune on disco duck like there's wow. not, it's not, it's not a song we were like hearing on the radio all the time but that was like just you know and at the same time 
every she stacks records one of the most iconic labels what was the output at you know who owns the music to that not a stella Axton, or sorry the publishing to that not a stella Axton. so you know i it's a it's a that business and especially where it is right now um with uh with without the revenue that comes from from selling the music you know it's tough it's tough to be a songwriter it's just crazy to watch that whole thing because you're watching it and you're watching her career, you know, gain steam and start to get incredible. And you're like, oh, well, this lady's got to be loaded because this is back when albums actually sold 10, you know, 10 million selling, 5 million selling full on real sales. And then when you find out she's not loaded, you're going like, oh, this is just criminal, you know, and uh, and imagine you know, because I, like you said, disco, I know people that wrote like one song and they bought a house in the Hollywood Hills uh, that was huge, you know, just from, oh, I wrote such and such. And you're like, wow, one song got you this, you know. So her with 10 songs, you're thinking set for life, you know, and then the color purple. It's just crazy to me. So that was uh, that had to be a uh, part of the gruel the beat down on her, you know? I think it's hard to not, I mean, she, she has a line in the film where it's just a, you know, it's a constant struggle, um, I guess, basically to validate yourself. And I think that's true for all of us. And I think with, with her, she, what was amazing, and she, when she got um, inducted into the Songwriters Hall of Fame and we show part of the speech, in the film, you know, again, Alice always, her outward persona was very positive. She was always trying, you know, her glass was always full. And she took that moment, which is out of really out of character for her to just acknowledge that she actually did find it very painful to not be, to have, to have been the songwriter she was and to have not been given the opportunities or the, the monetary value that her male peers were being given and basically saying to the music industry, like there's a lot of women here that are talented and you guys need to change and, and the culture needs to shift. And um, it's, I think that that was of obviously like just how like it helped feed her as an artist, but of course, that's painful. It's painful. You know, I mean, I think there's an aspect of wanting recognition and, and there's a spectrum of that. And yeah, I guess it can be very shallow to be, you know, wanting fame. But then at the same time, it's like if you do something like September is the fifth most successful pop song in the history of music. Yeah, you want yeah. to be seen for that. I mean, she sold 60 million records, probably, uh, you know, more every every week, you know, so. When you see that number, you're like, that's huge. That's huge. You know? Yeah. What, uh, who, who owns the house now? Her partner? It's actually very cool. Um, it's the Willis Wonderland Foundation. And Ali really, I mean, she wanted her house to be turned into a museum. It's a little bit challenging because it's a very delicate space. Um, although they do do tours and they have been trying to, they've been doing songwriters workshops and whatnot. But the big project that they're doing right now is putting a songwriting program in Los Angeles public schools. Um, and really trying to reach underserved kids, reaching uh, songwriters that are women, people of color, LGBTQ+, um, which is just awesome because I think Ali is, I mean, one of my favorite things when we share the film with people is that I think because of the timing of like what her hits are and, and, and whatnot, you might expect an older audience, but I feel like Gen Z, like they, she's like an, I just a Gen Z icon. Like she's so in the zeitgeist of what that generation is talking about and how they're thinking about their own identity and pushing back on societal expectations. And so I think the fact that the foundation is trying to create opportunities for them and, and younger generations um, and try to find songwriters that might not be ushered in through kind of the, sort of status quo system is is really awesome and our public schools need more arts funding so it's great that they're out there creating more programs so that um you know and hopefully it's something that once they create a template for it can it can grow from there how can you take a tour of the house now is it in valley village or in Stewart? valley village that's what i thought she was yeah. just think how ahead of a time she was because valley village now is kind of pricey you know 
Oh um, yeah. When she, I mean, she overpaid, I think, cause she like, it was, there's a funny story. She went to see the house with her girlfriend at the time. I think her accountant, she'd finished September and a few other things. And her accountant was like, you need to go buy a house. So she's looking for houses. And in those days, nobody wanted to be in the Valley. I mean, you no. just did not want to be in the Valley. Like we interviewed, if anyone remembers from MTV, uh, just say Julie, Julie, the Ju not, uh, Julie Brown. And yeah. she was, that had a Valley girl persona that she, she did as one of her characters. And she was saying like, you couldn't get your friends. They wouldn't come see you. It was like you had moved. So of course, Allie Willis, like, you know, money burning a hole in her pocket, at least at that moment in time where she's got all these hit songs early in her career, decides to go buy this very expensive house because of its architectural significance in what was then North Hollywood and not even a nice part of the Valley. Um, and when she went to see the house with her girlfriend, when they left, her girlfriend was saying something to her like, oh, you know, did you see this and that? And I mean, how great you're going to have a pool. And Allie was like, oh, my God, there's a pool. Like she'd fallen so in love with the house. She didn't even notice this like gorgeous pool in the backyard. Um, but but then later, realtors came along and they they give neighborhoods cute names so they can raise the prices of real estate. No, no. <laughs> yeah, Valley Village was just yeah. perfect for Allie because it's so kitschy and so ridiculous. So she loves when that happened because it was like, oh, I live in Valley Village, whatever that is. Hilarious, hilarious. What what uh? So is it going to be a museum or is all the stuff still in there? How it was in the it film. Is. Yeah. So, I mean, it's basically been left intact. I mean, there's stuff that, that they they built um, like an ADA compliant bathroom in the backyard. That's not quite finished um, to accommodate, you know, maybe it'll be artist salons and stuff. I don't know how long it's going to stay there. Um, but certainly right now, um, right now it's how she left it with the collection as she had had it curated and, um, and uh, it, I mean, for you, like, let's talk offline. If you want to go do a tour of it, I know absolutely. That she would absolutely love to have you there. So a hundred percent. I don't, I, I can't speak to when and it would be open to the public, but if you're in LA, you know, shoot your shot, maybe make a donation to the Willisville, uh, Willis Wonderland foundation and see if they'll let you come over. They, they might, I don't know. I got to go to that anytime I'm, I'm home this week, next week, let me know. I got to see it because I, I love architecture. It's one of my huge, uh, huge loves. And then I absolutely loved her. Uh, and I love this film. And, and I was so fired up to see it when it came, when they sent it over to me, I watched it immediately. And I was like, Oh my God, this thing is so good. And man, I think I cried a couple of times. It's, it's pretty, it's pretty brutal, you know, uh, oh. in, in an honest way. And well, thank you so much. Cause I feel like, you know, I think it was funny as, as much as she stood out, it, she had a hard time getting people to pay attention to her in her lifetime and making an independent documentary like this when the person isn't already really well known, even if their work is, is really challenging. And um, I, at the same time, I'm like, I know if you watch it, you'll be so glad you did. Cause it is really emotional, but it also leaves you with something uplifting and it kind of, I don't want to say it leaves because it was, it, you know, it leaves you with something in your own life to think about, which I think is really wonderful, especially right now. I mean, Allie really believed that everyone had a creative germ and that if people were allowed to nurture that, they'd be better people and we'd live in a better society. And I, I, that just feels so timely and important right now. And oh. You know, so yeah, I hope people got a chance to see it. And I just, I appreciate that, that, that you were, you were already like in that's, that's your part of the tribe. I feel like her house is almost like a bat signal. Like if you get it and then <laughs> oh, we yeah. can all find each other. Here's a, here's a question that uh, I had to ask. You got the music in the movie. Did you have to fucking pay for it? Even though she wrote the songs. Oh Yeah. Oh. And um, <laughs> oh. I, my producer Nick Holes and our supervise, our sorry, music supervisor did a phenomenal job. I have to say, in terms of there was a lot of goodwill in the music industry, but licensing music is not for the faint of heart. It's always, and there's always like, there's always some song that maybe you don't even think is going to be that hard compared to, you know, and it's, and something comes up or it turns out like, a different estate owns it or i mean the 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 it, it's like those um 
you know, in those like kind of like mystery shows where they're like have the board, like it's hilarious sometimes to think that you're like, you're dealing with like a, a major label. And all of a sudden it turns out, oh, we went through our files and so-and-so bought the rights to this song 30 years ago and you're going to have oh. to deal with. So yeah, it was, we, we, I think considering the situation and I, for, I wish I, I, I should ask Nick for the next time I can answer this question, but we licensed a lot of big songs and they were a very small movie. So um, everyone that was on my team did a really good job. I'm really grateful to them that there wasn't a single thing where I had to say, Oh, I can't have this. Well, congrats on the film. Now, when does it come out? Is it in theaters? It's going to be on, where's it at streaming? Yeah, we're like the we. I feel like we won the lottery. We're working with Magnolia Pictures, so they're oh, releasing the best. it. Yeah, they're releasing it in theaters. It's going to be starting this weekend, the uh, November fifteenth. It's going to be in Los Angeles, New York, um, Detroit, Dallas. There's a whole list of cities. If you go to their website, Mag Picks, like Ali Willis, or if you just go to the world according to AliWillis.com, you can get this information. And then on the 19th and 20th of next week, we're doing a bunch of day and dates in smaller cities, um, which I'm, I think are mostly art houses and stuff. So if you like, look, look it up if you're interested in seeing it, because it actually might be playing very close to you. It's playing in like 30 cities. Um, and then we'll be on VOD, I believe on the 22nd, but don't wait for that. It's so, it's a fun movie to see with people, um, in an audience in a room full of people that are like-minded. So I hope people get out and, and go see it, uh, see it next week. I, I want to go see it in the theater. Cause I just watched it, uh, in a hotel on my computer. Cause I tour all the time, but I want to go see it with the boom and music and, you know, just the visuals of the house and the parties and, you know, big screen, it'll feel good. You know? Yeah. Uh, thanks. Well, if you want tickets for any of our shows, you just let us know and we'll make sure and, and hook it up. So, oh, yeah, I'm all over that. And then hit me up. I'll go look at the house. And uh, if you ever want to see some comedy, let me know. Come on down and maybe you'll do my documentary. Who knows? <laughs> that would be awesome. I definitely uh, always looking for my next project. So I appreciate there it. Is. Yeah. <laughs> and I got as much stuff as hers. Not as much, probably. Ali. <laughs> I don't, I don't have five con storage containers, but I have the exact timeline. <laughs> you don't need five storage containers. Believe me, a lot of it didn't make it in the movie. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, thank you for doing the show. Congrats on a fantastic film. Uh, the World According to Allie Willis. It's out this weekend. This is a must-see for documentary people and music people. Uh, most of the fans of my uh, podcast will absolutely love this documentary. It is an incredible story. And uh, whenever you think you've had a rough day, you have to watch this and just think of the struggles this woman had and where she ended up is just so inspiring. So thank you for doing the film. Oh, thank you so much for having me. It was so fun talking to you about it. Um, and I look for, I'll, I'll definitely come check out your show as well. So oh, yeah. Yeah. you, you got to come. I'm at the comedy store all the time. Perfect. That's close to me. All right. Thanks so much. Thanks for doing the show.